Hello, you good people out there, and welcome back to this beautiful online seminar. Um, we still really look forward to having you all here physically next year, but so far we'll have to do with online. And it's going to be great, I tell you. Um, one of the things we touched upon in the first seminar was your role as a composer and how it somehow uh, you know, uh, exceeds the boundaries of just composing music. Uh, once in a while you also get to, to music supervise a bit, and this is exactly what this short seminar is about. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce you to Jean-Paul Vell, uh, my highly esteemed colleague uh, out in composing film music and uh, occasional film music supervisor, I understand <laughs> it. It's been a while since we saw each other last time. And yeah. Ieli Brandel, uh, a long time independent uh, a music supervisor now working for FST, which is the Swedish Society of Composers. So welcome to you, and I'll just uh, leave the scene to you and take questions for you later. Thank you very much. Uh, so welcome to this uh, seminar on uh, agreements uh, and the workflow of productions. Um, my name is Dali Brandel, and uh, uh, as you heard, I work for the Swedish Society of Composers, and I also work as an independent music supervisor and sync manager for film composers Frid and Frid, and also Cosmos Music. And with me today is Jean-Paul Wall. Please uh, tell me more about you, yourself. Yeah, so my name is Jean-Paul and I work as a Swedish composer in Sweden. Uh, and right now I'm working on a German movie. And the job I had before that was an American movie. And I dabble a little bit in Ethiopia, uh, Africa. And so doing so, I come across some legal issues here and there. And I'm in no way a legal expert, but... I do have some experience with some legal issues that might be of interest to other composers. And I'd like to share that today. Yes, thank you so much. That is great. And also, since we mentioned it, um, being a music supervisor can be uh, a lot of work and perhaps sometimes you as a composer can do some certain things uh, yourself. Uh, but to mention that, um, uh, we're not going to like have the time to delve into all the things that a music supervisor uh, does. That's like another seminar. But we, we will just go through the workflow of uh, uh, the productions and talk about what agreements and documents that might be needed. And also, uh, if you are to license uh, other people's music, what to think about as a composer. So please, um, if you could bring up uh, the next slide, please, or the workflow. We're just going to set, um, yes, and, and the next one as well, please. So this is what we're going to talk about today. Uh, we're going to go, uh, go through the workflow. Um, and also, as you can see, um, the uh, agreement process and all the documentation is of course something that you do um, right up, up from the start until the end of the, and the finished delivery of the music. So next slide, please. We can start out with ac accepting the agreement or accepting the assignment, I sh should say. Right, uh, there's a slight delay here, so I, I see it on another screen here. Um, so I, I don't know how to do this in a good way. But but uh, basically, yeah, uh, congratulations, you got a job. Um, and this is a time to start talking about how you're going to work together and what is expected from you. Um, and what you can expect from, let's say, the director or the producer or the production company. Um, I think one agreement is just verbally. Already when you talk the first time, you know, you got the job, all that. Maybe you want to put that in the mail and just make sure, is this what we agreed on? Um, I would advise everybody to have a written contract, but more often than not, when I start a project, I don't have a contract. 
it's it shouldn't be that way, but that's the way it is. So uh, an easy way to do it is just to put it in a mail and say, is this exactly, did I understand you right? This is what you want. Um, yeah, so, and, and so it's really important to have something great then. <laughs> and, I think and so. We, I think yes, so, yeah. and we're going to talk more about what, what to include in the composer's agreement a little later on. Mm. Uh, so moving on to the next slide, um, get to it. Yeah, that's... No, oh, sorry, um, what, what music is needed is first, yeah. Right, so, so you would have a, a very creative time where you just throw everything in the pot. And one thing I say to, in the beginning of every project is, to understand what you don't want might be the biggest step forward. It might not feel like it at the at that stage, but it is. Just rinse things out. We don't want piano. We don't want um, hard rock. And, and build some kind of a structure. And then when you have those rules, you know, maybe break the rules too. I mean, it's, it's a good creative time where anything is possible. And you should explore that. Hmm. And of course, here it's really important that you have a good dial dialogue with with uh, with your production team, the director and producer and editor. Exactly. Yeah. 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 Okay. So, what's next? The next slide, please. Yeah. So, getting to it, start composing for real. Like uh, this is where your talent come into place, and you have to. Yeah, really compose and just do a lot of stuff, a lot of stuff. I always put music everywhere and then I start taking it away and then I put it back in and move it a little earlier, move it a little later. Um, and and just also tr try things out. Yeah, and, and if, if there's uh, an external music supervisor in place, is this also where you talk about what it's supposed to be? I think so. Yeah. 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 Um, and, and I mean, right now we're, we're talking about, uh, possibly being your own music supervisor. Um, not that that's anything we recommend, but it does happen. Um, uh, then, you know, choose songs that you think is possible to, to, uh, fit into the budget. Mm. So, you, so, you, don't, you know, don't, don't go crazy, but yeah, you should be creative, but, don't go crazy. Mm -hmm. Okay, so next mm. slide, please. Uh, now we go to locked edit. What happens then? Well, locked edit, this is when everything starts costing money. This is where the clock is ticking. You have the real time to work is between locked edit and, and uh, delivery. And um, yeah, that's a very hectic time. And I think if you have any other projects going at the same time, you should have solved that before locked edit so that you can totally focus because this is a very um, hectic and critical time. This mm. is when yeah, and, and, shit and hits how, the fan, basically. Yeah, and how long do you usually have, would you say, between locked edit and delivery? Yeah, it's it's very different, but I would say like on an average, maybe six weeks or something like that. Mm. Um, mm. But but it differs a lot. It differs mm. a, a lot. And I mean, if you're working with a high end director, maybe they can even move the delivery dates a little bit. Uh, mm. But if you're working on a let's say a German crime series that I'm doing right now, there is no moving around anything. It's mm. I mean they have a broadcast date that they're aiming for so you can't be late you just can't be late and um, i know you have some experience with with un, unfortunate like things happening in in the process that shifts the deadlines yeah that, that can um i've had uh, on two occasions i've had directors dying and uh apart from dealing with uh, shock and grief you have to uh, keep working. There will be a new director, possibly other people will be new in, in the process. And if you don't have, I mean, we, we'll touch that a little later with the real paperwork, but if you don't have certain things written down, you might get into trouble and, um, and you might have to work a lot for free. And, and uh, yeah, mm. that might not be fair. 
So this is something that you should you should perhaps not. Of course, I mean, someone dying is very unexpected and not something that you can foresee. But but just like having in mind that like you have a risk assessment that what might happen. Yeah, yeah like like mm -hmm. a pandemic, for instance. Yeah. Exactly, which we yeah. all have have experience of, and 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 yeah. productions being pushed and and yeah. so far. Crazy things that do happen. Crazy. Yeah, things unfortunately. Happen. Yeah. Yeah. So the next uh, step in the workflow is the approval process. Yeah, the approval process can be a little complicated. It happened to me more than once that I built this really. Um, close relationship with a director you share everything from you know philosophical thoughts to personal things attached to the film and you dive into everything and then when the approval process starts you realize that actually it's the producer that decides and then mm. when the producers have told you that this and that doesn't work and this needs to be more like that then there might be an executive producer or there might be somebody at the TV channel or at the distribution company. So there's a, a chain of command that you might want to figure out on forehand. And, but I'd say more often than not, um, it's really hard to figure out. So, so it, it, it just happens to you and you have to sort of be okay with that. Uh, and, and that can be, mm -hmm really painful i'm looking at the screen here and there to see if i miss something but yeah <laughs> and yeah right and, and and what it says here on the screen is that it's also uh, a good time to start looking for the rights holders for the additional songs that is in uh, the movie and uh, that might seem like a really late time to do it but actually which we'll come to later it's really hard to do it before that because you don't know if the song will be chosen and sometimes it's not even chosen by you it's chosen by someone else and it's like the end credits or something mm -hmm. and so it's not until then that you can actually approach the rights holders and that would be the the publishing company or the record company um, not until then can you do that so mm -hmm. Exactly, right. and we will yeah. we will delve a bit more into this later. Yeah, uh, but moving on to now, it's time for the music delivery. What 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 do you think about here? Well, uh, there are a, a few things. Um, I mean, of course, the formats. I mean, that's that goes without saying. You know, do you want to? I mean, once upon a time, I just delivered tapes, uh, and now it's more. I think more often than not, it's a brutal session of some kind, uh, but it could be that they want it totally fully mixed in 5.1, mixed in a cinema. Um, it could be, you know, new formats every day, Dolby Surround and all kinds of things. So all that is to, to uh, be considered. Another thing is, um, let's say the, the movie I, I worked on recently was with a Vietnamese director and it was shot in Mexico, but the production company was in Los Angeles and the sound studio was in New York. Wow. And, um, and it just takes a while to figure out what, where exactly are the files going and, and, um, and who do I need to notify that the files are actually there? And also one thing that is really easy to forget is the, the dates and the times, the delivery dates, because of the time difference. If you're eight hours off, that could mean a lot. If you have an expensive studio in Los Angeles or New York, that, that's thousands of crowns uh, an hour. I mean, many. Yeah, so they're waiting for the delivery. And yeah, it's, yeah, yeah. So, so yeah, so communication you need, need to figure basically. That out. Yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. Do the math. It's, well, what does it yeah. mean? <laughs> Eight o'clock, New York. What What does that mean? Yeah, uh, for yeah. you, sure. Yeah. yeah. So moving on to the next slide. Uh, now we're going to talk about the heavy stuff, the contracts and the paperwork that might be needed. You can go on to the next slide as well. We will break it down a bit. 
So Jean Paul, what what contracts have you? I've understood you. You, I mean, it's quite different from from um, uh, working on a, a local production here in the Nordics, and perhaps to a European production, and then to uh, big American productions. Yes, I think when I work in in, in Scandinavia, I have a basic contract that covers almost everything. Uh, <clears throat> you might want to add a little thing here and there, but basically my contract covers everything. Uh, when, uh, the, the movie I did, I, I did done a few movies now in, in America. I've never come under 20 contracts. Um, so you might want to get real legal advice on that. Uh, because it can it can get a bit messy. It's not super complicated. It's just a lot. Um, so so I'm, I'm looking at the screen here beside me, and and yeah, a contract for all the participants. That means everybody. Uh, you 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 might need to look into it. That all the musicians, all the sound people, maybe there's a mixer, maybe there's somebody else, maybe there's a solo person. Mm. All these things can be important. Uh, mm. And of course, the licensing agreements with all the additional songs. And we'll go deeper into all these contracts later on. And then the cue sheet, what music goes where in the film. Mm. Uh, and one thing that's happened to me recently is this double taxation form. Some countries will withhold your fee because uh, their tax authorities want to make sure that you pay tax in your country. Otherwise, you have to pay tax in their country. And at least in Germany, it can take up to like something like five, six months to get your money back. Um, so it's not That's a big problem. something that you need to consider for sure. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and just... Uh, get that paperwork started as soon as absolutely possible. The Swedish tax authorities are super swift. It took me like two days to get everything fixed. But Germany is taking at least five months, I'd say. Mm. And that's a little... So, yeah, that's, yeah. that's a long time, yeah. Um, yeah, it is. So the next slide, we're going to start talking about the, a, a bit more about the composer's contract. And as uh, Jean Paul said before, uh, we are not legal representatives. So it's really important that if you do not understand all this uh, yourself, seek legal guidance. Um, the most often you can get help from your composer society or if, if you seek your own legal representative, which is really important. So that, um, especially on bigger productions that everything is in there um, and that you don't, you, you have all, all the paperwork <laughs> for, for, for your benefit. Exactly. So what should yeah. be included then? Author's rights, performing rights? Yeah, author's rights. I mean, all the author's rights, that's something that's very dear to me. And that, that's what I basically live from. So that's very important. Hold on to as much as you can for as long as you can. And that is author's rights and performing rights. That's really hard, really uh, important to hold on to. And uh, your publishing company can, can help you with that. Um, also, I find that you might might want to put into the contract a, a minimum and a maximum of of uh, how much music is needed. Uh, maximum, because if you have a really complicated score with a lot of orchestra or something, it's going to cost you a bit to hire an orchestra. So that's going to be a little complicated. And you have to write the score and all that. That might cost you, and you might need to know that. Um, and also, and, and if you exceed that number, maybe you should be compensated for that. But also, the other hand, I mean, what if you're working on a project and suddenly they decide to take your music out and put something else in there or, or whatever? Then you will miss out on the performing and the author's rights. So that will also affect the, the financial outcome of your project. So both those things can be uh, important. 
I mean, it's, it's, it's hard to regulate in a contract, but I think you should try. Yeah. And yeah. also, I mean, when it comes to like dates of payment and stuff, what, what happens if, if there's a hiccup in the production uh, exactly. deadlines? Yeah. And how, how are you covered? How do you make sure that you get paid uh, as expected? Uh, mm. And also, of course, since we're talking about music supervision, if, if uh, you are taking a responsibility for some of the music clearance of, of uh, other type of music that you don't written, you, you don't write, you compose yourself, then that should also be in the contract and you should also get paid for that, of course, since that task uh, would normally be a music supervisor or um, the production uh, that the, the the producer of the production who who does that yeah yeah, yeah. okay um i'll just break take it to silence and just break in uh there's a question from finland here mm -hmm. um sure saying do you need double taxation agreement if you have a company and send an invoice i think a very relevant question very relevant and, and i would say you absolutely need that that that's exactly they need um, in Swedish it's called hem vist in tig, but it, it's basically uh, you need a paper that says that you as a legal entity exist in your country both as a person and as a company so you need that and 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 uh, a, a stamped and signed paper from uh, your local tax authority. So no tax evasion here. No, sadly. No. <laughs> okay, uh, I just have to to point out to you that we've got six minutes left. Yes. So, sure. oh, really? Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah. So, really yeah. so, so I, I seem to remember you saying we'll talk about this later. Uh, so now is probably the time to wrap it up and take the the few points that you postponed till now. Yeah, we're moving on to the the next slide. Is musician contracts? Beautiful. Yeah, so we need contracts on all participants, basically. It's, it's just that. Um, everybody, musician, if there's an orchestra, maybe you need an orchestra representative. Maybe there's a sound guy that did some creative uh, input, then that person needs to have a contract as well. Uh, but but I know that you've, you've said earlier that this is perhaps not, not for... Um like local or European um, productions, but mainly. No, for I've, I've never, I've American. never come across that in, in Sweden, Yeah, but I've come across it every time in America. So, mm. yeah. and something that's also good to know is that there's something called union fees in America, where the musicians also uh, needs to be compensated for their, their um, participation. Uh, right. And that is also applied to if you're going to license music. Um, and I think perhaps also in Great Britain, but mm. that, is, that is the production who is supposed to cover those costs, not you. <laughs> that's, not, that's not supposed to go on your budget. So that's mm -hmm. also something to just keep in mind if you know. work. Yeah. yeah, exactly. So we'll move on now to if your um, other uh, additional music agreements. So I will just go quickly this uh, go through this uh, quite quickly. Uh, so if you're using source music that you haven't written yourself, um, then there are uh, to be considered two sides of a, a song. It's the publishing synchronization synchronization license, which covers the use of the song. And then it, it's the master synchronization license, which covers the specific recording that you're going to use. Um, and something that is also good to know here, if you're clearing music, is that, uh, that it, there's a term called most favored nation. Uh, and that is a term um, that comes from the World Trade Organization. So it's not a, just applicable to music licensing. It's, it's for all like trading. And so that is that one side shouldn't get more than the other side. So if, for instance, it's a very famous artist who um, 
argues that they should get a higher fee for the recording, then the publishing side also will get equal. Uh, and so that is something to just consider when you are seeking license. And if we move on to the next slide, um, as Jean-Paul was saying before, uh, it, it, the, the seeking of license of our source music is quite late in the process because you don't know. Sometimes you need to license several songs for a scene to, before you know which one is working with that particular scene. Um, and most publishers will ask you for all this information regarding the song before they will process your request. Um, so of course, what song will you be using? Uh, what artist? Uh, what media and what tour territory and of course how long will you uh, will you use the license for so this is very important and and sometimes can take a really long time just to get all the information before you can send a request um, and also we can we can go to the next slide which, which is the cue sheet yeah, the cue sheet is, um, I, I mean, I have my own cue sheet uh, of how I like to do it, but very often the production company or the distributor have their own cue sheet and and they follow a certain um, you know, structure. Uh, but basically it's just all music. I mean, if somebody is humming a song walking down the street in the film, that needs to be in the cue sheet and the rights holders needs to be contacted and, and, and the licenses need to be done so all the songs all the score all the source music all that need to be in there so all music needs to be in there um also one thing that they sometimes ask for in america again is a proof of submission that means that uh, they want some kind of confirmation that the cue sheet has been filled in correctly and sent to let's say ascap and all a proof of submission is, is basically a mail from ASCAP saying, yes, we received the cue sheet and it's correct. Um, and you just do a printout of the mail. That's, that's all they need, really. Yes. So um, the next slide is just a little summarization of all the contracts and the documentations we've been talking about, an overview. And the next slide is just to wrap things up, to get back to the workflow of the production and the contracts and paperwork that you might need. And yeah, and, and if uh, there's... It, yeah, again, it's like, a, we're not legal experts, but if you follow this list, you'll probably be okay. If, if you have answers to all these questions and you have this, you've considered this paperwork, you'll be fine. Yes. So happy to take any other questions, if there are any. Well, no, we don't have any questions, <laughs> unfortunately. <laughs> so maybe it's, it's a sign that you've been so totally clear and outspoken about this, so we don't need questions. Yeah, well, I hope um, it's been informative and I hope we can uh, share this information somehow to our people because uh, it comes back to author's rights and publishing rights. Uh, you know, that's something that we're defending really hard. And that's why we have this organization. And this is why we, we're talking about these things. Absolutely. Mm. Yeah. And it's been great. Thanks a lot. Super. Super. Okay. So see you okay. next, see you next year in the flesh, in the, right, in this place, yeah. I hope. Auf Wiedersehen. Auf Wiedersehen. <laughs> Bis bald. <laughs>